Hi guys, my name is Nadia Shabilski. Um, I'm currently employed as the performance and growth lead at Skirmish Gaming. Um, just in a nutshell, Skirmish Gaming is a competitive gaming platform launched about five years ago. Um, I've been there for the past just over three years now. And then previously I had experience in the luxury management industry and luxury brand management um, before I joined Skirmish. Um, so that's me. I would definitely, this sounds very cliche, but the importance of your network. Um, it's really something that I took for granted when I was studying. There were multiple talks, there were multiple opportunities to go meet people in different industries. And as a student, I really just didn't understand the importance of how networking can assist you in career growth. Um, something someone once told me that was also quite interesting is when you start your first job, even if you're at the most junior level, um, identify someone in the company that you aspire to be like or aspire to have their job, or even if it's someone whose job you might want to pivot in, and just go talk to those people. Ask them for a 15 minute setup, um, ask them how they got there, did they do any upskilling, was this something that they wanted to do from the start? Um, I actually did that. Um, I went to go speak to someone that did performance marketing and growth marketing because I understood marketing as quite more of the traditional sense um, where it's like PR or social media. And then when I sat down with someone that specializes in growth marketing, it really opened up so much more in my life and in my career. Um, I also then identified extra courses. I actually did one at red and yellow in performance marketing, and it just opened up my world to something that's not really so well known. It's like growth marketing, and it's really something I'm very passionate about today. Um, so just those two things, networking and just talking to people. So, like even if you're the most junior person, go talk to the CEO if you can. I'm in a startup, we could do that. Or go chat to the engineer if you're the marketing person. Um, that's really something I wish I did earlier, but luckily I'm doing that now. <laughs> that makes sense. Yes and no. Um, Academically, I actually studied an undergrad in politics um, and then very, very um, early on realized that was not for me. Um, I then kind of did a complete career pivot or academic pivot. I did a postgrad in marketing, which, like I previously mentioned, was quite traditional based marketing. Um, and then I decided I wanted to specialize more and go into a niche industry and actually ended up doing a master's in luxury brand management. Um, I traveled abroad. Um, I did a grad program there, and then I started working in the luxury yachting industry, um, actually for a yacht agency. So I was part of the internal marketing and events team. Um, and there I kind of started doing events management. More. We, um, I was part of the core team that had to organize yacht shows, the massive Monaco yacht show was part of that team. We did the Cannes yacht shows, and it was very much more events management side in a very, very niche industry, like I said, yachting, which was quite exciting. Um, I learned a ton there. And then I came back to South Africa just before COVID hit and kind of found myself out of a job, not even thinking about how I'm going to get back into the luxury industry due to COVID. And then I was luckily introduced to Skirmish by a mutual friend that I had at the time. And they kind of just started out. So they needed someone for three months to come in and help set up their marketing department. Let's say that. And then I quickly entered the world of gaming, which I did not know at all, was not interested in at all, but what really, really um, picked my interest was the growth of the industry and being able to pivot into tech as well. Um, I love the tech industry. I love the fact that gaming is one of the highest grossing industries. Um, it's so much more different just to what you would think working in gaming is. It's very product focused. It's very data driven um, and it's a lot of fun. So. Yes and no. <laughs> I kind of switched industries and switched careers, let's say, to more of a growth marketing side in tech. Hey, what's happening, guys? Uh, Chaz here from Libex. Libex is basically the Web3 company, a uh, blockchain company. Uh, we basically built our own blockchain. And on top of our own blockchain, we've built a multiple, um, multiple different uh, digital products like an NFT marketplace, 
a tokenization platform, a DeFi platform, OTC platform, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was basically uh, hired um, as a, a marketing specialist, but slowly growing into the role of becoming a product manager of the entire Web3 ecosystem. And yeah, I'm looking really forward to meeting you guys at the event and engaging and chatting to see how we can you know, grow together, learn together, prosper together. Yeah, so I've been involved in multiple different careers um, in my um, in my career path, if you want to call it that. I first started out as um, an actor and filmmaker, um, kind of progressed into marketing um, digital content, um, and then transitioned into the Web3 space for, um, full-time in tech. During all of that, um, they had multiple tech startups on the side um, while chasing this kind of um, directing uh, career. And um, yeah, we started a few apps in, um, along the way that have kind of come up and gone down. Uh, so yeah, I think I've got a graveyard of, 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 of projects behind me that have kind of, you know, where I've learned a lot from and kind of just taking forward. So I'm very grateful for my career. I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that have come by. So within that, I think I just want to highlight um, my very first big directing gig, which was um, a digital campaign for KitKat. And um, I think this, this experience was really out of my depth um, in the um, at the time of my growth trajectory, um, but at the same time still trying to like own it and still trying to take it in my stride and then you know put my best foot forward to deliver. And I think um, that really taught me the expectations of, of clients and agency, um, and obviously delivering a final product that matches that vision and those ideas, you know. So um, definitely high pressure, but definitely a great learning experience that, um, yeah, I'll do over again. Yeah, so like I said, um, as I was building my marketing career um, on the side, I had basically a tech startup. We had multiple different tech startups. So from creating our own apps, um, you know, to kind of compete with Spotify and, and Netflix. Um, we've, you know, kind of explored and um, got a little bit off the ground, you know, education platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And I think on that tech journey, um, I started to come across, you know, more specific things in the broader four, fourth IR um, uh, sphere. And um, I think the one thing that I really liked most about this whole fourth IR kind of shift was blockchain technology and that really stuck out to me so i spent a good you know few months uh, just kind of going down that rabbit hole understanding what the technology is looking at all the different applications of blockchain which includes cryptocurrencies nft smart contracts etc cetera, etc cetera. and um once it kind of once the penny dropped for me i was like there's no ways i can go back so um in a sense three four years ago is where i kind of made my full pivot and um, uh, that's when I was like, you know what, I need to be all in on Web3. So I started um, my final startup, which was Medina Labs, and um, basically just built, you know, for three, four years, just all the different ideas. I was just kind of pumping into this thing and then um, kind of crossed paths with Libex. And um, I just saw, yo, these guys are a lot further ahead of me. Um, I'm going to, you know, need a lot of resource to kind of catch up. These guys literally, their office is 16 kilometers away from my home. Why not just join them, you know? And um, ever since I made that kind of shift, it's a matter of just now taking all my ideas and actually implementing it on a daily basis, which has been incredibly rewarding. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited about Libex and the future that we're kind of building and the technology that we're embracing to solve some of Africa's you know, top problems. Hi everyone, my name is Sabiha Benibai and I am the founder and CEO of Jack Studios and we specialize in designing custom software for tech founders. Yeah, I mean, I think the first sort of thing to say is I was still a student when I started working and taking on, you know, projects that paid actual money. I think the one that I'd like to talk to you guys about today is the one that gave me my first batch of savings, essentially. So it was a big enough project that essentially I could throw into my savings account. So at the time, for context, I was a design 
and development student uh, at the Open Window University. I was in my second year of university at the time and didn't know much about anything, but knew a little bit about a lot of different things. So I essentially started uh, offering, you know, the little skill set that I had to anyone that had an extra 500 Rand or a thousand Rand to pay at the time. So I did dabble in a couple of things. It wasn't necessarily my first client, but it was the first project where I believe the budget was around 20,000 Rand at the time, which as a student is a nice chunk of cash. And uh, essentially, the project was to develop um, an investment portal that allowed um, people to view their balances, how much of money they've received, and then to be able to request a withdrawal. So luckily, this wasn't actually connected to any actual bank accounts. It was just manually managing uh, of the information that was presented to clients. Uh, as I said, I had like maybe six months of understanding about, you know, development and databases and coding and actually developed this in something called PHP, which I really hope no one is using anymore. <laughs> and I mean, on the outside, it looked beautiful, but if anyone actually looked on the inside, it was, oh, string cheese, you know, and PHP was also this kind of code where the back end actually sat in the same code as the front end. So things like security and data protection. I mean, it's not things I even knew about or had to, thought I needed to care about. But as I said, luckily at the time, there wasn't any high risk information necessarily. It was all manual. So uh, I would like to think very little could have gone wrong. At least I didn't hear much went wrong. But uh, at the time, I the way I actually got the project was one of the ladies that I studied with, she was focused on design and she actually knew the person personally, whether they handled her finances or maybe someone in her family. And they asked her to actually design this custom portal out. And then she contacted me to do the development of it because we knew each other and we studied together. So that also talks a little bit to, you know, networking and actually seeing the people in the room with you because those are the people later on that actually sometimes become your first clients or give you your first connections. So yeah, it was really cool to actually go through that process. It was so painful. I remember sitting every night trying to even just understand the basics of coding. And I remember the one night my dad visited and I remember I was trying to do something, I think for something that needed to generate on a monthly basis, you know, to say, okay, if I put this in once, it needs to show me the next 11 months. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. And I was trying to like Google and stack overflow, but I didn't know what the problem was. So I didn't know how to get the answer, you know? And, and I was talking to him and he's like, okay, but what are you doing? So, and he says, okay, but if you did it once, then surely you can do it 12 times. So I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And my brain went, instead of trying to find the optimal way to do this, I just copied it 12 times and manually updated it to the different months. Uh, but it's always a great starting point to get something working and then later optimize the code. And that actually became a project I worked on for a little while. And we had done, I think maybe a couple months later, even a redesign of that project and a redevelopment of that. And because it was extra money, it was something that made me also start to realize the value of development versus designs, what I was getting paid to develop it versus what the designer was getting paid. Um, and then starting to see the need of, you know, custom software and systems for small businesses and then for large businesses and how this could actually, you know, eventually take me into the career that I went into. So yeah, that was my first project that sort of taught me a lot of different things. <laughs> I think the best advice I could give is don't wait until you're ready to start. Like if you know something, there's someone that will pay you to get from zero to one because they don't even know what you know right now. So I think even if you have to do things cheaper or, you know, with high stakes, just 
just say yes and then figure out how to actually get it done afterwards. Hey everyone, my name is Lauren. I am a senior creative and team lead at Superside, as well as a creative director for Soap and Stone Studio. I have over 15 years industry experience and I'm so thrilled to be a part of this extraordinary event. So I think with all creative fields, everything always molds in together. And I actually started my career as a makeup artist and a fashion designer. And back in the day when Photoshop was still sort of making its launch into the industry, I became extremely hesitant with using some of the makeup or the fashion imagery that I was being provided by professional photographers. So I thought if I just did a quick Photoshop course, it would, be allow, it would allow me the opportunity to edit the photos and sort of maintain the quality of work through my makeup or the fashion design. And it was through there that I got into the industry. One of the lecturers at the time was super impressed by what I was doing, sort of navigated, are you in the design sort of course? I wasn't at that time, I was actually doing cosmetology. So yeah, that's how I got into my profession and it kind of became this long winding journey of me working in the design industry before I actually graduated in the design industry. So fashion, makeup, design, kind of all the same thing, but not really. Uh, but that's how I got into this crazy world of graphic design. I think just trust in your creativity, trust, trust in your intuition, because I do think that at that stage, either in the makeup industry or the fashion industry, I always questioned myself. And I think it was also, I found I wasn't following my own creative instinct. I was kind of seeing what is the current trend? How can I sort of align to that with my own twist? And I wasn't having my own creative voice at all. So I really like look back at that and think, gosh, would my trajectory have changed in the fashion or makeup industry if perhaps I did follow my sort of that gut feeling and follow that creativity that I wanted to express in either one of those fields? I mean, not that I look back and I ever regret getting into sort of this field. I just think that it would have been a little bit of a different path for me if I just really trusted in myself and really just expressed, even made creative mistakes, which I think is so important in either one of those fields. Hey everyone, my name is Joshua Weiss. I've uh, been a product owner for four years now, currently working at Specno. I studied information systems at UCT and have really always had a love for gaming. Uh, I didn't know how to get into that industry. I'm not a developer. I'm not particularly good at designing and drawing. So the really the only the way I had in was through esports and competing and understanding users and the problems. So I tried to get as involved in the industry as I could. That along with my degree got me an opportunity to join a gaming startup where it was kind of like a really gaming startup grind, <laughs> you know, the type of stuff you read about. We sat in that for three years. I learned a ton of lessons, um, learned a lot about product and what's involved in product before six months ago, jumping ship to Specno, where I now help other founders and businessmen, you know, start businesses and ventures. So, you know, I've always had this love for technology and gaming. Um, I went to school here in Cape Town and studied uh, IT that I really enjoyed, like coding. Um, in grade 11, our lecturer brought, well, our teacher brought in a lecturer from information systems at UCT to come talk to us about, you know, what is information systems? I had no idea. So he said something in that talk. He said, if engineering students are the builders of the house, then information system students are the architects. And that kind of stuck with me. Um, I knew kind of then that I wanted to be involved in the design side of things, 
but uh, well, rather than building them. But I didn't really know kind of what that looked like or, you know, what was design, how large design was at that phase. Uh, so I started studying information systems. Um, I still had this love for gaming, though, and I wanted to pursue this career in the gaming industry. It's not that I, you know, love to just sit here playing games all day. Uh, what I loved was the products that were being built in gaming and how much users cared for those products. You know, I always use a saying, you know, no one cares about a toaster. You know, <laughs> I want to be building things that someone spends days playing and day, day in, day out, hour, hour, hour. And then after they're done, what are they going to do? They're going to go talk to their friends about the game. And then they're going to go online and watch YouTube videos about it. You know, that was me. And I knew how much I cared and I knew how much other people cared. And I wanted to work on projects that, that had that sort of uh, passion behind them. Um, it was kind of a big problem, though, that I faced was I had very little opportunities in gaming in South Africa. The scene is very small. You know, we make the joke, it's 20 years behind film. <laughs> and, uh, you know, especially for someone who's not a designer per se, you know, I can't draw at all. I can do, you know, some messing around, but I'm by no means, you know, a graphic focused person. You know, I'm very much more on the tech side of things. But at the same time, I'm not a programmer. I'm not an engineer. I have a, a BCom degree. So I needed to find an in for me, and that was competitive gaming. So I started competing semi-professionally in games. I'd always been fairly good and proficient in FPS games, but in university, I really started taking it seriously, not because I wanted to be this pro gamer uh, who would you know, make millions of bucks, but because I wanted to understand the pain points that pro gamers went through and what were the issues they faced. How did the industry work? What was the relationship like uh, behind the scenes in the B2B? Uh, so after I'd competed a few years and gained kind of the knowledge that I thought I got to a level that I felt, you know, I knew what was happening. I played with some of the top guys. I'd made a few bucks. I got to quit my waitering job to, to play gaming. So, you know, I was, I was living uh, the high life. <laughs> Uh, but as the game sort of started to wane, you know, I was faced with the decision, like, do I keep going or do I move to something else? Um, and for me, that was the production side of esports. So together with a former teammate, we got together and we started a small broadcasting company that would live stream on Twitch. Uh, and, and I casted and I casted and I did analysis and just made a bunch of connections and learned a lot about the production side of things in the production industry editing, live streaming, sound, all these sorts of things. That side gig actually landed me the opportunity to meet two founders who were working on a gaming startup. I was putting on an event for a gaming lounge uh, and doing the casting and kind of my thing. And they went to this casting lounge and they needed someone to demo their POC for angel investors, who was those first round of invent uh, in investors. <laughs> um, and they weren't particularly good at the game. So they asked us gaming lounge, like, hey, do you have someone who's good? And they said, yeah, well, we got this guy putting on the tournament. You know, he's probably pretty good. So they messaged me and they reached out and I said, yes, uh, you know, get in the habit of saying yes. Uh, and shortly after, I kind of went to the gaming lounge with them. I put on the kind of my casting voice and my <laughs> like the showmanship that I'd gotten from production. And, you know, talk through the decisions I was making and I put on a show for the investors. And the founders were really impressed from that and kind of asked a little bit about me and my experience. I was just finishing my degree. It was the end of 2019 uh, at that point. And the following year, 2020, I joined that gaming startup. I was the fifth person on their team and I joined as the gaming intern. Um, I didn't know where I was going to fit. I knew nothing about building digital products. And that's how I joined. And things I did know is I knew things like community building. So how to get people to care about your product. You know, I really knew that side, how to get people to show up for tournaments. And that was the role I originally took. Through there, I started moving more towards the design side. And you know, when I talk design, I'm not talking graphics. I'm talking really horribly drawn wireframes and data flows. And what I understood when I would look at an application is not how good it looked, but where we were collecting data and how could we make that journey better and how could we improve more people getting through. 
So I started adding value there on the side. And eventually that moved me into a product manager role. Um, I was also empowered my, by my degree. Being information systems, it's a combination of business and development with just enough of both. And it kind of empowered me to create these diagrams, right? So I became a product manager and I started designing the app because I knew what the users wanted, I knew what the ecosystem needed, and I knew the technology. Um, and over the years, I started developing my design principles. So my UX started getting higher and higher fidelity, and then eventually moving into UI. I'm still not a great UI designer. In fact, I'm a horrible UI designer, but I'm quite a good UX designer um, and CX, which is kind of the larger experience around that. Um, and I helped that startup. I sat with, with them for three years. We did you know, fairly well, but it was the proper kind of startup grind. And I really do believe that I have uh, you know, gained all that knowledge and you know, went through everything typical startups go through. After three years, I, I said goodbye, my adieus, um, left with no, no harsh uh, feelings or anything like that. I got a really great opportunity to, to elevate my career and to jump to the next path. So I joined a company called Specno, and we describe ourselves as an innovation agency or a venture builder. And what we do is we help founders and you know, first-time entrepreneurs create their businesses. And a lot of the lessons that I learned, I applied that to uh, these new founders. You know, things like the hard questions, like monetization, protecting yourself as an entrepreneur. And that's what I do now. I build applications, uh, MVPs, so we move very quick, very lean, and, uh, and validating concepts. Uh, yeah, and I manage about three projects at a time and completely you know, self-taught in the world of product. Hi guys, uh, I'm Low Roots, uh, the founder of my company called Low Roots. Um, I, my background is industrial design and I decided to go into furniture design um, yeah, full time. No, um, I, tried, I tried to go the mental route um, and I see the value in it. Uh, if you can find a fit, I think that's the big thing is um, if you can find the, the, the right fit for you. Uh, you know, if I, speaking to students, my advice would be if you want to be a pioneer, it's very difficult to find a mentor. Um, and I'll give you an example. Like I had a guy who, who um, was my mentor. He was, uh, there's this company called CEDA. I think it's a government initiative, so they sponsor it and help you. And they actually prescribed uh, this mentor to me, and we had a chat. And he said, "Why would you want a showroom?" I was like, "Well, it's I've got tangible products, and it's not something where you just drop the money online. You know, people want to experience it. It's quite a high ticket uh, item." And they said, "No, no, 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 that's not the route. You know, I make rubber mats." And I'm like, "Oh my word, here we go, rubber mats." And uh, yeah, no, no offense. It's just like you can't compare premium furniture to rubber mats. I mean, and that to me was just a signal. This guy, you know, we're just not going to fit. And I said, yeah. And he explained to me his theory, and I understand it, but it's not applicable. It's almost like if they can't help you, they will um, take their vision and place it on you. He doesn't. A good mentor would take his experience into consideration with your vision and then apply it and basically his concept was well uh, i just stocked builders warehouse and now i have like 30 sh 30 showrooms countrywide i'm like yeah that's just not my game and uh, i tried you know several ways and i just realized and it just dawned on me it's like when you it's so difficult if you want to be like like imagine you wanting to start a company like ferrari how do you explain that to the middle class, you know, or even affluent people? It's like they, they don't, it's very difficult to convey your vision, if, especially if you have high hopes or yourself or, uh, you, yeah, it's, it's just impossible. And that's why it's like going into a jungle with a machete and you just go by yourself. 
You know, you just hack your way through it. That's the way I see it. And yeah, I just couldn't find someone to pair up with. I'm sure that there there would be someone, but it's so difficult, especially I find in South Africa, um, people, they don't dream big. Uh, I'm not taking, I'm not talking about taking over the world, just big, you know, just like bold. Um, yeah, I think that's the big thing is like not a lot of people get it. Uh, and it's very difficult if you can't find a mentor who doesn't get it. It's like, it's got to be a trailblazer, you know, if you want to set things on fire. Um, yeah, you need someone that has made a couple of fires in their life. You know? It's almost like the world is constructed to be mediocre. That's how I found it. Just be mediocre, fit in, you know, you're just another, uh, just roll along, uh, you know, roll al along with it. And it's just like, no, it's like, I want to break the machine and jump out. It's like, could you make my own machine or whatever, you know?